Good afternoon. So this session, VMTN 6642E, is based on GDPR. Um, so I'm Kyle Davis. I'm a solutions architect for CDW. Uh, used to be Kelway. Um, I'm mainly focused on workspace technologies. So it's kind of a, a strange topic for somebody that does workspace to come and talk about. So I decided to come and do something on this for my own benefit, really, to read the regulation that came out and give you my take on it a little bit. So some disclaimers, which we have to put on there. So there's a VMware disclaimer, which isn't really relevant to this session. And then there's my disclaimer. So I am not a lawyer by far. So if you really need anything it's a legislation perspective, go and speak to somebody that actually does that for a job rather than me. Um, the other thing for me I want to make very, very clear for GDPR is technology is an enabler and an assisting hand in becoming compliant for GDPR. It is not the answer. It is not going to be your saving grace. It's not going to be that silver bullet. It is not going to basically make you compliant by the time frames for next year. And the other thing as well, all the thoughts are my own. So my employer may not be their views as well. So I just want to put that out there. And it is all about getting you thinking about this if you're not already. And you really should be. So we're going to try and cover a hell of a lot in this time window, really. And from my perspective, if there's any questions, I'll be standing over there afterwards, come and grab me, and we'll have a chat on some of these areas. Um, we, we don't want to do is crowd the stage and have questions if there is any questions, because there's other guys that need to come on and present. So there's a first question for you guys, really, is who is currently doing something for GDPR at the moment? Don't be shy. Hands up, everybody. Hands up. OK, a couple. That's slightly worrying, if I'm honest. <laughs> um, next question. Who has no idea about GDPR? And be completely honest with yourselves, apart from that guy at the back. <laughs> not even looked at it yet. So these guys that aren't doing anything about GDPR, but you believe you know something about it, that's even more worrying that you haven't actually looked at it and done something about it. Final question. Who thinks it doesn't apply to them? <laughs> come and find me afterwards. I'd love to know why. Um, I've had many people come say, it doesn't apply to me. I'm a central government person. I've got data, great data classification. I've got all my data mapping flows all done. I'd just love to know why. And if anybody thinks that moving your data out of the EU will solve your issues, it's, it, that's what I'm going to do. That's all I'm going to do. So time frames. The main time frame to be aware of, 25th of May 2018. This has now been in play for coming up to two years when it comes into, into play. So everyone should have, in theory, have been aware of this for two years, which most people, <laughs> three months, six months, maybe 12 months tops, most people have started looking at it. And there is a lot of work to do to become compliant in any way, shape, or form so that you don't basically lose out on it, basically. And just to make it very clear, it is legally binding to all EU member states. So anybody in the crowd from the UK, apart from me? OK, a couple. Um, when we go through our old Brexit, it will still apply. So thinking that you'll wait and get away with it for 12 months after it comes into play, you still need to do it. And there's reasons for that as well. So firstly, there's a difference. So in 1995, the EU brought out the Data Protection Directive. And I wanted to make it very clear what the difference is between a directive and a regulation. So the directive is it's a bit like that Homer Simpson episode where he gets cloned over and over again. And each clone is different. And it's very much the same as what people have done with like, the Data Protection Act in the UK, and which was formed from the DPD. And it's all got local variations. You've got your language changes, which makes a little bit of changes as well. So there's no standard conformed way of, of, of data protection across the EU at the moment, really, because everybody has their own little take on it. Whereas the regulation is very much like the Lord of the Rings, one ring to rule them all, one regulation that we will all basically be working towards. And that, that is ultimately what they're trying to achieve. Some definitions, because without definitions, it's kind of hard to understand where you kind of get to. So when I actually read this, this regulation document, and it's about 200 pages long-ish, and it, it, in honesty, it is one hell of a boring read. It takes quite a while, because if you're not au fait with legal terms and legal wording, you end up reading the same section three or four times just so that you can understand it. And then you've got to read it in its entirety three or four times before then it even starts to make any sense. Then you read it again, and it still makes complete different. Every time you read it, it's different. It's all about subjective. 
So personal data. Personal data is anything that's directly or indirectly going to link you to that data. So basically, that could be anything from your name, date of birth, credit card details, address, email address, that kind of stuff. The other thing that this GDPR has brought into play is online identifiers, which isn't currently in place with DPD. So MAC addresses, IP addresses, online identifiers that you may use for target ad agencies, cookies, all that kind of stuff that has your information is now covered in the GDPR. Processing, yeah, this is the one I like the most, because whether it's automated or manual task, it's still classed as processing. But if we look at what they mean by processing, storage. Storage of that data is classed as processing. So doing nothing with it doesn't mean that, that you can just get rid of it and do whatever it might be. It's, if it's stored somewhere on your network, or in the cloud, wherever it might be, it's still covered by GDPR. The one that makes me laugh the most is the word use. What the hell does the word use mean? If you look at the English dictionary and the thesaurus and bring up what it actually means, it basically says access, um, sharing, opening, basically having, basically having it in your hands in, in the dictionary it's based on things like that. But it basically, from my perspective, it covers all data that is personal, whether, whether you're doing anything with it or not, my opinion. Um, profiling, so to analyze, predict aspects of people's lives, understanding what their interests are, their likes, dislikes, Anything to do with their behaviours, race, all that kind of stuff in classes profiling, and that's got a massive section in the GDPR that you need to conform to as well. Pseudonymization, basically hashing your data to make it so that you can keep the data for research purposes if you are a, a like a, a research lab, and you can keep that for a longer period of time, and you don't and it doesn't identify it back to that individual. It means you can keep it for longer, and if you pseudonymize it and you encrypt it and you do a few other things, it allows you to basically get laxed rules on processing that data under GDPR as well. Um, controller, basically the person that says, this is the data, this is what I want you to do on the processing side of it. This is how you're going to process your data. The processor is the person or organization that will do it. And in your organizations, it might just be a department within your organization. So you as, I don't know, IT could be the controller, and then your HR and finance departments potentially may be the processors. We've got to bear that in mind. And one of the key things as well is that the GDPR covers natural people, basically, and it basically means living people. It doesn't cover deceased. I'm going to ignore consent, because we will stand here all day talking about consent, and the consent to take data and share it and all that kind of stuff. But basically, it must be freely given, unambiguous, and clear on what you're going to do with that data. It's got to be extremely transparent. And if the data subjects are not aware of what you're doing with that data, then you need to basically let them know in a clear way. Personal data breach, anything that happens to that data that shouldn't, well, that covers you for um, basically the risk factors, the penalties, the fines, and all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to go into a lot on the penalties and fines, because it is a massive scaremongering tactic on you're going to get fined this much money if you don't do this, this, and this. And it's not, it's not true. It's not true at all. It's a massive myth. International organizations, any organization that basically resides and has an agreement in more than two countries, basically. So why the need for the change? DPD was in 1995. There's a load of things on there that was happening around that time. So we know it's there. There's no social media. There's no online gaming. There's none of this kind of stuff. And we're looking at like JavaScript being released out in 1995. The first iMac in 1998. Windows 95, 98, and NT for, for those that are actually interested in that stuff. Google came to play in 1998, which obviously started to collect a lot of data in the background to be able to actually allow that search engine to do what it does today. But the, the, the biggest change is when the 2000 era came into play, when we got social media, MySpace, Facebook, Bebo, Twitter, where you get all this personal information about people's lives, and then it's just stored for everyone to see and take and share and do something with. The biggest, the biggest one for me, because I've got a, a, small, a small child, is Pokemon Go. They know where your children are better than you do, without a shadow of a doubt. They know whether they're in the park, whether they're in the, the mall, or wherever it might be, they're going to be there. Like, like, they could basically track your child if they really wanted to. And that, that's worrying, extremely worrying. And when you sign up to Pokemon Go, because I did, um, you basically have to give them a lot of information about yourself as well. So they have your name, your address, your email address, and then they know where you are. There's a lot of risk in that, a lot of risk. So 
as I'm from the UK, I've got some stats for, for the UK-based households. So we'll focus on 96 to 97, which is roughly where the directive came into play from the EU for the, the Data Protection Directive. And there's only 27% of homes had a computer at the time. In 98, 99, which is just a few years on from that, only 9% of homes had internet access. So we didn't really have to worry about online identifiers and data being processed online, because there wasn't that many people doing it. So when the directive was written in 95, no one ever thought this stuff would take off. No one ever thought that MySpace and Facebook and all these guys would be getting all this information and doing whatever they do with it. So the DPD, when it first came out, it has 34 articles. The GDPR is 99. That's a massive increase in articles that you need to look to conform to. There's a lot of recitals as well, differences. There's lots of detail on consent, where there wasn't one in, in DPD. The detail on children data processing wasn't in the DPD, but there's an entire section on basically processing lawful data against children of, of a certain age as well. So we need to be mindful of what data you hold that may be on children. Um, the right to be forgotten. So in the DPD, you do have a right to be forgotten, but only if the data is inaccurate or it's unlawful. Other than that, you haven't got any right to be forgotten. Whereas in the GDPR, there's about 20 conditions that allow you to exercise the right to be forgotten. So if you take those and you actually don't want to be remembered, you can go and use those to your own benefit to be removed from databases and whatever it might be. And there's no enforcement as well um, of the DPD. So there's no fines, no sledgehammer approaches, no leading authority that's going to come in and audit you and all that kind of stuff. Whereas in the GDPR, there is. I'm not going to go through all of these, but the main ones for me is this one-stop shop. And I've kind of put it as kind of, because I think when they tried to do the GDPR, they wanted it to cover everything. They wanted an organization to respond or to basically be regulated by a single leading supervisor authority. And that is kind of true, apart from if your company sits in multiple EU states, for example, you're then going to have one organization you will choose to, to work with, but then if another country deems that you are using that data unlawfully, they can bring in their own regulator as well, and you end up with two for that specific um, breach or regulation thing that they're going to look to do on you. Um, transparency, as I mentioned before, it's basically got to be clear. And it's got to be machine readable, it's got to be able to be structured, it's got to be exportable, all that kind of stuff as well. So when we start looking at the data sets we have, can we export it and prov provide it to somebody in a meaningful way that they can reuse? And a lot of times, a lot of uh, technologies out there that may lock you into a specific file extension or specific software or the specific backup tape library that you need to use to do this, that kind of stuff. So you've got to bear that in mind, you need to share this stuff, you need to be mindful that it's going to be electronic. So Elizabeth Denham is part of the ICO in the UK, so that's the UK's leading supervisory authority. And one of the myths that came out was that everybody's going to get fined. If you are not compliant by the 20th of May in 2018, you are going to get fined. You're not going to get fined. She's basically come out, and over the last 12 months, she's been working with 17,300 cases on helping them become um, compliant towards GDPR. Only 16 of them got fined out of the 17,000. So it's not going to be literally coming in and saying, you owe us money, give us a load of money. It's not like speed camera traps and all that kind of stuff, just to give extra money to the government. Uh, and the other thing is that, she actually explicitly states, for the UK at least, that it is a sledgehammer in the toolbox to use if needed, but they're not going to enforce it on you. Every organisation does not need a data protection officer. It is advised because it means there's somebody managing those processes and keeping on top of it for the life of your, your business. Um, but there's only really those, those conditions there where you have to have one. And it's either giving somebody that that responsibility and accountability to do that job or actually assigning a DPO in the first instance. And Article 37 gives you that information on when it applies, when it doesn't, and what their tasks are as part of that role. It clearly outlines what they should do as part of their job. GDPR is a Europe-only issue. No, as I said earlier, it is not just an EU issue. It is every organisation that monitors and consumes with EU citizens. So even as Brexit, as we leave and become our own whatever we're going to be, we're still going to need to be compliant. We're still going to consume and sell services into the EU, as the United States would do into the EU as well. So we still have to be mind mindful of that. And 
Recital 20 and Article 4 outline that in detail as well. Controllers don't need data processing agreements. This is more of a law thing for contracts, right? So you are a data controller. You've got a, I don't know, a, a service provider giving you a managed service for something. The terms and conditions of the GDPR for you as a controller cascade down to that, that processor without anything. It's still worthwhile having an agreement term in place between you and your processors, though. So if you're a service provider and you're providing services to somebody on data processing, you should have that agreement in place, even though it is covered by the GDPR anyway. And Article 28 gives that information for you as well. Biometric data. So everyone's looking at palm scanners and facial recognition logins and all that kind of stuff now. Um, it's only covered in GDPR if you can identify it back to the person. If you can't identify it back to the person, it's not sensitive. It's not personal identical information. Therefore, you can do whatever the hell you want with it. Same with genetic information under research labs. If you can't map it back to somebody, it's not covered. And Article 9, again, outlines that in a lot of detail. The pseudonymized data piece here, um, it is covered like data that's not pseudonymized. The difference is, if you encrypt it and you pseudonymize it, which is, this is all extracts from the actual regulation documents, it's not me just writing a load of words, you'll basically be allowed to encrypt and, and, and pseudonymize your personal data and you will get relaxed conditions. So you will not have to do X, X and X against that data, whereas you would have to do it against non-pseudonymized data. You've just got to bear that in mind. And again, Article 33 and 11 cover those, and, and, and that's probably one of the most interesting bits to read, because if you want to keep data for a long period of time and not spend your life managing it and looking after it in an extremely um, operational intensive way, then, then that's where you would look to go. The fines. Um, only going to touch on it for two seconds. Article 83 outlines what fines you could potentially get, and um, it outlines which articles they reflect back to. So you will not get fined, for example, on some of the articles in there. They are just advices, they're things you should be looking to do. 2%, um, 10 million euros, 4%, 20 million euros. Like I said before, it's not, if somebody gets fined that kind of money, you've been extremely unlucky. And in the ultimate honesty, you've probably not done your job. So telecommunications provider in the UK, um, they got fined £400,000 for an attack and a breach of data. They then got fined a further £100,000 earlier this year for an attack and breach of data. And this wasn't under GDPR, this was just under ICO guidance to, to get to a certain way. Under GDPR, if we look at that rule set of 2 and 4%, that fine could have been up to £70 million purely because of the 2 and 4%. But you shouldn't be getting to find that kind of money, and you should be working towards becoming compliant, which then it gets laxed and laxed and laxed, and before you know it, you're down at a very small area of risk. There's a bit of information on there on what happened in that organization, and there was about 15,000 bank details that were stolen. It's about 10% of the overall data that was captured was bank details. They did have two early warnings that this was going to happen, though. So when the ICO came in and audited this, they'd actually found that they'd been hacked two times before that, but nothing was taken. But they had no way of knowing, no way of telling, and, and it basically happened in, in the worst possible way. The ICO's investigation found that there was basic steps that had not been taken at that time, and basic steps being technical weaknesses in the database software. Running out-of-date database software, out-of-date operating systems, out-of-date this, that, and the other, leaves massive risk and attack footprints for, for cybersecurity footprint for guys to come and attack you. And they didn't scan the infrastructure properly, for possible threats. And I don't, like I said before, technology isn't going to fix GDPR for you, but if they came to audit you and they said, what have you got in place to stop this stuff from happening, you should have an answer. You, we patch at this level, we do this, we have this change control process, whatever it might be, so that they're clear that from a, a technology perspective, you are up to date and you're doing what you're actually trying to do. If you're doing absolutely nothing and you're running Windows NT and, and um, and 2003 operating systems still, you really need to move off those. 2008 goes end of life soon, we need to get off them as well. So we need to start doing this stuff to get off it for our own benefits, from a security perspective, never mind the GDPR, but it does come into play. 
So this is the quote, and I've highlighted a few of the main areas that, that Elizabeth Denham brought out. So in spite of the great expertise and resources that they had in that organization, the issue was at a boardroom level. Not having the time and capability, or time, should I say, mainly, and, and the sign-off to do these changes that could cause minimal downtime versus what actually happened in the, in the long term. Escalation structure. So that is the structure. This is where most of you will be, data controller, more than likely, with third parties, internal organizations, third providers, your data processors. As a data controller, you are responsible for managing the third countries, which being anywhere outside of the EU or any other organization or country you work with. Third parties being any other organization that you may share or not share data with, so you need to be clear on what you are passing to them. And then it is your role as a data controller to escalate that as a breach notification to your leading supervisory authority within 70 odd hours. If you're not doing that, and it's not for everything, in, in the regulation it does tell you which things are classed as high risk, and you only have to escalate the high risk things. You don't have to escalate everything because you're basically causing a lot of mayhem. And then they will make a statement back to the EU Data Protection Board if they feel it's fit. So the ICO have given us this advised approach in the UK. The first thing really is, is quite key, awareness. Getting in front of your senior leadership teams, getting in front of your board members, letting them know about what this is, when it's coming, the financial potential impact, the reputation risk, all this kind of stuff to basically say, it's not just about the organization as well, because as a director, you can be fined directly as well, if they wanted to fine you, up to a certain amount. You should know what information you hold, who you're sharing it with, um, what you do with that data, making people aware of what you did out of the data, know about the people's individual rights. There's all these things that you need to look at doing at a very high level. And this is the advised approach from, from the leading supervisory authority. It takes time, and we haven't got very long. So where organizations are struggling, in my opinion, so far, is getting the buy-in from execs to actually see this as something they need to spend time and effort on, and potentially releasing funds and, pro and budget to do something, whether that's budget for technology, budget for people, it doesn't really matter. There just needs to be something there to get people moving with this. Understanding the impacts and risks to the business, so reputation, not just fines, it's, reputation is the biggest one, because if you lose your reputation, you lose your income, you lose your business. Forget the fine, the fine could wipe you out anyway, if you did get the high one, but the reputation is going to be key. Again, lack of budget and resources, and there's ways of getting around lack of resources, and you can bring people in to help you. You can do that. So I work for a, a, a reseller who have people that can come in and help. It's getting people in to help you to get compliant or as close to compliant as you can be by May the 28th, that, it is, that, that is probably advised if you haven't got the resource in-house in to do it. And this does cover all organizations, not enterprise, mid-market, small. It's all organizations. Um, and so they don't actually know what data they hold. So they've got a file server with 12 years worth of unstructured file data as an example. How do you know what data is in there, what personal information? And in GDPR, if you're not doing anything with it and you're not using it, you have to get rid of it. So you need to know what's there, basically create a log of it, in, in layman terms for me, being a master of Excel spreadsheets, having an Excel spreadsheet said where the data is held, who you share it with, and um, why you've got it, is probably a good starting point without doing something extremely fancy and it wouldn't take you a massive amount of time or a lot of money. And when they come in to audit you in that potential chance that they do, you can sit there and go, yeah, it's a bit rudimentary and it's not fantastic, it's not very flash, but here's some information that might, might help you. And they'll go, oh, at least you're trying. But some organizations probably won't even try. And they're the guys that will be in, in a lot of trouble. So my advice starting point, start talking about it plan your approach, plan the articles that you want to, to look at doing. So look at the differences between what was in the DPD and the GDPR and find the gaps that you've got in your, in your business. Get buy-in from those key people in your business, because without doing that, you might as well not bother and just admit the fact you're going to get slapped with a fine or reputation risk and all that kind of stuff. Um, do document all the data, as I mentioned before, in some way, shape or form. And it does put a massive emphasis on data controllers to be accountable. So you are accountable, even though processes are now accountable as well. So it does kind of cascade a little bit. But as a controller, 
you are accountable to make sure this is in place. And then certain parts of the GDPR have more operational impact in some organizations than others. So if you're a target ad agency or a full online organization doing like, I don't know, bank transactions, e-commerce, all that kind of stuff, there's probably a lot more for you guys to do than somebody that's like, a, I don't know, an MOT car like center or something like that. So it kind of comes down to just looking at what those articles are you need to adhere to, putting a plan in place to do it, naming the people to do it, getting that buy-in from the execs, and then when May 28th comes along, you should be in a place where at least you're a quarter to halfway of the way there, rather than being in point zero where you've done absolutely nothing and you've hid your head in the sand and yeah, then, then things start to go wrong next year. As with VMworld, um, VMware have a legally approved document that outlines what they can um, basically help in GDPR. And these are some of the areas that they can do. I'm not going to discuss any of them in detail, um, but the next slide basically has the articles that VMware can help with and the products that will help you to do that as well. So, as we see here, the GDPR description, so literally a very small description, the article they're using, and the product capabilities from VMware that can, that can help you because coming compliant. And in honesty, it's basically vRealize and NSX, as you probably guess. There is kind of a, because my workspace background, there's a, there is a kind of a, an idea from me, which is if you virtualized your applications and your data from a, a virtual public application or, or from a virtual desktop, whatever it might be, or a containerized app, you've probably got greater control over it than what you would do if you had fat client PCs all over the place. Mm -hmm. So for me, if you're looking at being able to restrict the processing of data, having it centralized and managed centrally is probably something that would help with Article 18. It's not, that's just my thought on it, though. So VMware can assist again. There's got the VMware booth, go and speak to the guys on there. There's two sessions on GDPR that VMware are running themselves, so it's worth, worth going and see those. And that's pretty much it from me. So I thank you for coming, and if you have any questions, come over. If not, have a good day, and I might see you all for a drink later.